but his powerful brain waves cradled in the warmth of reasoning. It's time for Johnny Walker Dread to straighten you out on a thing or two. Emanating all the way from exciting Las Vegas, Oklahoma, it's the Johnny Walker Dread Show. Okay, so let's go ahead and read a Yahoo News article here. This kind of gives a little bit more information about what happened and makes it far more understandable about what took place. The oldest of four children, born to Paula Bryant, four kids, a nursing assistant, and Myron Hammonds, notice that they don't have a job description for him, Kaya Bryant was removed from her mother's home in 2018 and spent 16 months living with her grandmother, Janine Hammonds. When her grandmother was kicked out by her landlord, okay, there you go. They didn't pull Micaiah Bryant out of the grandmother's home. The grandmother lost her home. The siblings went into foster care and spent two years cycling through short-term placements, arrangements that dissolved one after another. So why did the landlord kick the grandmother out? Well, again, as I said before, I think there are two possible reasons. One, grandmother was not supposed to have kids in the house per the lease agreement. Or two, Micaiah Bryan and her sister were tearing the hell out of the place. Now you may think, oh, how could you say such a thing? Well, let's read on. The shoot of the system. In 2018, Paula Bryant had moved with her five children including a teenage son from a previous relationship, into a house in West Columbus. Hammonds, Micaiah's father, did not live with the family. Hmm. I wonder if that could have a deleterious effect on how kids grow up. I think not having a father around might have affected Micaiah Bryant in some way. Was that a racist system's fault? And Paula Bryant described herself as raising the children largely on her own. Okay, starting to see a little bit of the problem here. Andrea Douglas, 37, a pastor's wife who lived two doors down from the Bryant family that year, recalled the fights between Paula Bryant and her daughters. The girls ran out of the house terrified and were hanging out in the backyard screaming while the mom was yelling at them. Gee, I wonder if this could explain maybe why the kids were taken out of the house and placed into foster care. Recalling that she was worried about their safety. Mm -hmm. Okay. The family had been on the radar of children's services for several years. Was it because they were black? Or was it because maybe there were some problems that were going on inside the household? amid repeated complaints that the two youngest children were absent from school. Mm, okay, so you see some parenting problems here. In February 2017, Bryant took Micaiah, Janiah, and two younger siblings to one of the agency's offices and said she was at her wit's end and could no longer handle them, according to a children's services document. So, okay. It looks to me like these two kids are pretty tough to handle. Uh, maybe some behavior problems. And, of course, the parents have a lot to do with that. You can't blame the kids for all of it, but you can blame them for some of it. But then again, I understand being mistreated by your parents. Well, one of them he didn't even mistreat. He, didn't, he wasn't even around. But that could affect the way that you turn out. The move had been difficult for her daughters, who missed their friends on the east side. Well, okay, maybe if you behave better, you wouldn't be taken out of the house and you wouldn't have to leave your friends. They were kind of rebelling in the home, she said. The police came, Bryant said, when she was arguing with Mikai and Janiah over bedtimes and their younger sister, Azaria, ran outside and yelled for help. Okay, so let me ask you a question there in listener land. When's the last time you heard that the police had to be called to a house because of an argument over bedtime? I think the problem here wasn't just an argument over bedtime. I think that the people inside the house were lunatics, okay? They can't get along. They're berserk. And that's why the police are called. Police aren't called for bedtime arguments. You know, you need to go to bed. No. I'm telling you, you need to go to bed. It's 11 o'clock. I don't really want to. Go to bed. Call the police. Well, yeah, is that how that works? 
All right, here we go. The officer said, and this, by the way, is what the mother is saying. She's admitting this. The officer said, you have just lost control as a parent, meaning you can tell them to go to bed, go upstairs right now, and they're not going to go. The children told police officers that they had suffered physical abuse from their mother and an older half-brother, a half-brother, okay, according to the mother's lawyer, Michelle Martin, though Bryant denied ever abusing them. Well, okay, you can deny all you want, but I don't know, it's not looking too good here. A magistrate judge dismissed the abuse claims against Bryant in February 2019, but found that she had neglected the children, according to court documents. Well, not showing up for school, that would be a part of that, okay? Bryant said she was detained while Micaiah and her three younger siblings went into the paddy wagon. Okay, so I suppose that that's when the police trucked them away, and that's probably when they started entering into the foster care system. Hammonds, their grandmother, took the four children into her two-bedroom apartment. After about six months, she began receiving $1,200 a month in aid from the state to cover their care. You know, $1,200 a month? Whew. Service agencies offer far less support to family members who agree to take care of children in need. The per diem allowances paid to licensed foster parents are often 10 times greater than the public assistance paid to relatives. A grandparent can become licensed as a foster parent, but it can take as long as six months. Then Hammonds' landlord found out that the children had moved into the apartment and told her she would have to move. Now keep in mind, the way it's written, it sounds like the landlord was like, well, like, <laughs> oh wait. There are kids living in Grandma Hammonds' home? Can't have that. Out, out, out. And that might have happened. But it could also be that the kids were just raising hell and people were complaining about it. She scrambled, placing the older girls at a summer camp and the younger two siblings in temporary foster care. When the camp ended, she had few options. In desperation, she called the children's caseworker to ask if she could take them to a hotel with her for a few nights, but the caseworker said that was not allowed. And the reason why is because being in a hotel is considered homeless. So, yeah, I can understand why they were denied. I mean, it doesn't seem reasonable if you only need to put them in a hotel for a couple of nights, but, you know, that's the way the rules are done. He told her to drop the two older girls off at Franklin County Children's Services. There was no chance at that point that the children would go back to their mother, who was still struggling to meet requirements for counseling and scheduled visits, which kind of code for she was not showing up for her visits. Instead, the county placed all four children in foster care. Hammond slept wherever she could for several months until she secured a home that could accommodate the children. In December 2019, Hammond submitted a petition to the court for their return, but it was rejected. Now that seems a little bit unreasonable. If she has managed to finally find a place for the kids to stay, you would think that such a petition would be reasonable to agree with. You would think that the judge would go along with that, but we don't know what were the particulars. There may have been reasons why it was just simply not a good idea to go ahead and let her go back to the grandmother, who knows. And as it says, although the court's reasoning is not known, the Children's Services Agency had reported to the court that Hammonds had failed to meet all of the children's needs and had not made sure they attended all necessary counseling appointments, according to Martin. The girls, meanwhile, were placed in separate group homes. The two sisters moved through a half dozen living situations, ultimately ending up at Moore's house on Legion Lane. Now, you may wonder, why are they going through so many different living situations? Well, that's not too uncommon in the foster care system, but it could be that these two girls were just so difficult to handle that the foster parents just gave up on them and called social services and said, hey, enough, man. These kids are nuts. Who knows? I'm not saying that's the case, but when you hear them moving through a half dozen living situations, the first response is to think that that's the system and the way the system is built. It just kicks these kids and just moves them from one place to another. But sometimes the kids are kind of at fault for that. Ultimately ending them at Moore's house on Legion Lane, that's where all the ruckus took place, not far from their grandmother's house and together for the first time since they left her care. Okay, so let's see, what could go wrong now? By this spring, Janiah Bryant said, Moore's home had become increasingly tense. 
In the weeks leading up to the shooting, she said, Moore had accused the girls of stealing the cards that carry cash benefit for food. Okay, so now we have a theft complaint. Okay, is it legit? Don't know. And she said Moore sometimes left them unsupervised or with former foster children, women in their 20s who, Bryant said, berated them and mocked her sister's speech impediment. After school on April 20th, the two Bryant girls found themselves alone in the house with Tiona Bonner, 22, one of Moore's former foster children. Bonner, who had come to celebrate Moore's birthday the previous day, was now scolding the girls, saying they were habitually disrespecting Moore. Okay, it's called a family argument. She's like, my mom told you all to clean up this house. It's dirty, Janai Bryant said. Okay, but... Sounds like a perfectly normal thing to say to somebody if the house isn't clean. The dispute escalated quickly, but when Janiah Bryant called Moore, who was at work, she said she was too busy to get involved, Bryant said. So each of them called for backup. Bryant called her grandmother, and Bonner called another young woman, Chayante Craig Watkins, 20, who had lived in the house as a foster child. So <laughs> you can imagine what this is like. So you have a, an argument going on between uh, Janiah and Micaiah Bryant and this girl, all right? And they're arguing over how dirty the house is. And what they do is they call people to come over to back them up in their argument. You have got to be kidding me. I mean, why not just clean the house? Hammonds rushed over and described standing on the stairway inside, trying to protect her granddaughters as the older woman threatened to beat them up. Bonner had pulled out a knife, Janiah Bryant and her grandmother said. Okay, I didn't see any such knife, okay? And Micaiah had grabbed a steak knife from the kitchen. Okay, so she was inside the house, and these others are outside. So why are you going outside with the kitchen knife? Janiah Bryant went into her home and called 911. So it wasn't Micaiah Bryant that called 911. It was Janiah, her sister. In the call, placed at 4.32 p.m., she asked for help as people shouted in the background, and there was plenty of shouting. That's one thing that I just hate about these calls. The police get out and people just yelling at each other. It's 3171 Legion Lane, Janiah Bryant told the dispatcher. We got Angie's grown girls trying to fight us, trying to stab us, trying to put her hands on our grandma. Get here now. Twelve minutes later, the police arrived. Okay, the police arrived. At that point, everybody should stop and say, okay, police are here. Let's go ahead and let them handle it. But no, they couldn't do that, could they? In a brief lull, Craig Watkins left the house, and the sisters began to pack up their things, thinking the worst of the situation was over. As they rushed out of the house, their father was pulling in to come to their aid. But also arriving was Craig Watkins, who had returned with two more people. Oh, my God. Oh, this is terrible. The two groups crossed paths, and Craig Watkins spit toward the family. Janiah Bryant and Janine Hammond said, I feel like that really made Micaiah really mad when she spit. Well, okay, but you don't stab people over that kind of stuff. That's when everything just went left. A police officer stepped out of his car and walked toward the driveway just as Micaiah Bryant turned her attention to Craig Watkins and could be heard on a video from a neighbor's surveillance camera threatening the stabber. As Micaiah Bryant charged in front of the police officer, Craig Watkins tumbled to the ground. Okay, she's on the ground. Okay, that's, uh, can't attack her at that point. Well, you never really could attack her from the get-go. She's on the ground. She's defenseless. And Myron Hammonds tried to kick her. Okay. So this is confirmation. I'd always been told that it was the father that was trying to kick the girl on the ground. It was. And by the way, trying to kick her in the head, that's assault with a deadly weapon. I don't know. Okay, well, we're right. I'll let... I'll let the people look at the laws in, in Ohio for that one. Micaiah Bryant turned to Bonner and backed her up against a car. 
Micaiah Bryant raised a knife, and Officer Nicholas Reardon, a white 23-year-old, okay, everybody make sure that we all understand he's white, okay, who was the first officer to approach the scene, unluckily, shot four times at her. As Bryant's body lay on the ground, police officers led her sister inside Moore's house along with her father's young son. Before an officer took her phone, she sneaked into a bathroom and made one more call for help. Call for help? The police are already there. You've already shot your sister. Who are you going to call? Oh, wait. I called my real mom, my biological mom, the incompetent one. And I told her, I said, I need you. They just shot Micaiah. Get here now. To do what? Okay, I can understand her if she was looking for some comfort from her biological mother. Okay. Despite what the dimwit lawyer said, the state did not fail Micaiah Bryant. People have a misunderstanding of what took place. The incompetence of the parents has been glossed over a lot, but it looks really bad. The father doesn't seem to even care at all, except for the time when he gets to kick some girl's head in. And the mother is, by her own admission, just a truly rotten parent. The kids were neglected by the parents, not the state. It's completely understandable that the state would take the girls from the parents. The parents are incompetent. The real scoundrel here, in my opinion, is Myron Hammonds, the father. Where in the hell have you been? Why were you not helping raise your kid? At least you can say with Paula Bryant that she tried. She was rotten at it, but she tried. He didn't do anything. And so they gave the kids to their grandmother and 1200 bucks a month to help pay the, the expenses. And I mean, that's not a lot of money if you're trying to take care of two girls. I mean, I get it. Or was she trying to take all, care of all four? No, I think it was just the two. But whatever the case, it wasn't the state's fault that the grandmother had to give up the kids to the foster care system. The grandmother got kicked out of the house. She's homeless. She even admitted to having fine places to sleep. She can't take care of those kids. And so it's left up to the state once again to step in and try to fix this situation that was not the state's doing. I mean, I'm not a fan of child protective services in, to a large extent. I think they can be heavy-handed and, and mean-spirited. But in this case, I, I don't see where they made any mistakes at all, really. Only thing you might be able to say is that when the grandmother got her feet back on the ground, maybe they should have went ahead and let the kids go back to the grandmother. They had their reasons. They stated them. Are they really good reasons? I don't know. But it looks to me like Micaiah Bryant, Janiah Bryant are real handfuls. They cause a lot of trouble wherever they go. They have been placed into one foster home after another. I have a feeling that the foster parents are like, oh, man, we didn't bank on this. They're rebellious, disrespectful, and probably really loud and emotional. And, yeah, I, I imagine they probably wear on people pretty quickly. It's not the state's fault. Let me know in the comments below what you think. How much is the state to blame for this? Like my video, subscribe to my channel.